tax uh, res resilience, or what is a resilient tax system uh, for now and for the future? Um, the word resilience is a theme word for the Public Policy Week, uh, and resilience is defined uh, in the dictionary, it depends on which dictionary you look at. There are sort of technical and physics and uh, electronic uh, terms. It also means, though, the ability to rebound or recover quickly to be both robust and adaptable to changing circumstances. And so as I'm uh, starting to uh, build a research agenda for the new Tax and Transfer Policy Institute, and as you would have seen in the media and in policy forums, we have a potentially a white paper tax reform process. We also have a lot of ongoing issues with uh, the way that our tax system is, is administered uh, with taxpayers from all levels, individuals, small incomes, small businesses, all the way up to multinationals operating globally. So uh, what is resilience of the tax system in that context with such a diverse array of sort of participants, beneficiaries and taxpayers of that system? An even more fundamental question might be, why do you care? Uh, we, we might leave that debate for another day, uh, but um, we, we can probably assume that our tax system does fund the public goods and services that we have more or less agreed as a democracy that we want. So for tax systems, resilience includes, I think, the ability for tax revenues to recover after a crisis. Uh, businesses and individuals lose jobs, go into losses, fail to pay the revenue that's uh, needed to, uh, to manage the broad uh, public service. The revenues decline in those situations, for example, after the global financial crisis. Uh, we want a system where revenues are resilient, will recover. Uh, Tax systems need to be able to adapt to changing circumstances globally and locally. New technologies, new currencies. Uh, you, we, we now have a Bitcoin uh, machine in, in the, the main um, mall in Canberra. Uh, different kinds of employment, different ways of working, different ways of caring for family, different forms of investment and saving, changing life patterns and longer lives. So we need a tax system that can respond uh, in a productive way uh, to these uh, long-run as well as short-run changes. Uh, following the news, you could be forgiven our tax systems under outright attack uh, under, uh, from various angles. Global tax evasion, capital flow, calls for a parliamentary inquiry into multinational tax planning or for drastic lowering of the company tax rate to be competitive in the region or uh, struggling with uh, administrative and compliance costs uh, for different aspects of the system. So I'm really delighted that I have such a wonderful panel of people here today to uh, introduce some key ideas for you and help us have a debate uh, about these different aspects of resilience of the tax system from a range of different perspectives. Um, briefly about myself, so I, I only took up appointment uh, as director of the new Tax and Transfer Policy Institute a few months ago. The institute was recently established here at the Crawford School uh, with uh, some uh, federal research funds. Uh, previously I, I was a professor at Melbourne University Law School, so I come out of a legal uh, perspective on, on tax law and compliance. Uh, I've worked in academia but also in both government and in private practice. Uh, the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute has the aim of building a research agenda both for the short term, these short term policy and white paper type processes that are ongoing, the BEPS issues with tax administration, but also for the longer term, for the national good and in the region as a whole. So of course we can't have a debate about resilience without participants and we do have some really fantastic participants today. So I want to introduce each of them to you. Uh, then each of them is going to speak for a short period of time. Uh, and then I will come back and we'll sort of open up for significant debate, throwing back to our members of the panel to bring their perspective from uh, the, their different um, areas of expertise. Uh, so immediately to, to my right, uh, Mr. Chris Jordan uh, AO, who was appointed as the Commissioner of Taxation, Federal Taxation, uh, just 18 months ago now, beginning of 2013. You might be interested to know that, that Chris is only the 12th 
Commissioner of Taxation uh, in more than 100 years of administering our federal tax system. So we have a pretty uh, you know, stable uh, administration over all that period of time. Uh, Chris brings more than 30 years, I'm uh, not suggesting Chris is 100 years old, by the way. <laughs> you can tell that he's... <laughs> you, can, you can tell that he's only 35. <laughs> so, somehow he has more than 30 years of experience uh, in the tax profession, uh, in tax policy, law development and impl implementation. He's been an advisor to Labor and Coalition uh, governments. He had very substantial engagement in public policy and uh, tax, tax reform and administration processes before becoming a uh, commissioner uh, when he was um, uh, in uh, private practice uh, for, for decades at KPMG, eventually leading the New South Wales uh, partnership practice uh, in that, he was a member of the Board of Taxation uh, for many years, which is a, an advisory board liaising uh, with, with business and other taxpayers in the Treasury, uh, chartered tax advisors. So although I'm introducing uh, Chris to you as a leading administrator, he brings that uh, depth of private sector uh, experience uh, to that role. Um, next, to, next to Chris, we have uh, Carrie Sadik, who's a professor uh, in tax at QUT uh, Business School in, in Brisbane uh, with law and accounting uh, qualifications. Uh, Kerry's uh, also uh, admitted to practice uh, as an advisor but has been a, a leading academic for many years. She recently contributed a chapter on the role of the G20 in tax regulation uh, for CEDA, the Committee for Economic uh, Development in Australia for their uh, G20 contribution. Uh, so Kerry researches primarily in international tax and uh, tax expenditures. Next to Kerry, we have uh, Richard Dennis, uh, who is sort of got a very high public profile as executive director of the Australia Institute, very well known and a highly research-oriented uh, public policy think tank, does do work in the areas of tax and welfare as well as many other areas of public policy. Uh, and I've been very impressed with the work that Australia Institute has done over the years in, in tax. So Richard, an economist by training, uh, but really worked for the past 20 years in policy and political uh, roles. Um, recent years at the forefront of what you might call somewhat heated sometimes and controversial debates uh, about uh, climate change, mining industry. And we know that in the tax area, we did have two quite large taxes that uh, have recently been removed in those areas. Uh, Richard uh, is also an adjunct uh, associate professor here at the Crawford School of Economics um, and government at the ANU. And has published academically as well as engaging in policy. Uh, and then uh, on the far right, uh, Mr. Paul Abbey, a partner at um, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, I've uh, had the pleasure of knowing Paul for many years. Uh, he did a lot of uh, postgraduate uh, engagement and teaching with us at Melbourne University over the years in, in tax law. Uh, over 20 years experience advising local and international uh, business and individual clients. Uh, but Paul has in, in recent years uh, taken big steps leading Price Waterhouse Cooper's engagement in tax reform. Uh, so PwC has a, a major tax reform project. They're putting substantial amounts of uh, economic, uh, legal and analytical time into researching tax reform. Um, most notably, they've been engaging with uh, business CEOs and financial officers, chairman, uh, union and community sector representatives uh, to try to uh, build... Uh, I'm not sure if you're trying to build consensus, Paul, maybe you'll talk about that, to, to build at least communication about the different interests in tax, uh, tax policy uh, and potential for tax reform. So those are our, our four speakers. And look, with that introduction, I'm going to turn over straight away to Commissioner Chris Jordan to kick off this discussion. Thank you, Chris. Well, uh, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Miranda. And uh, I, I, I was talking to my wife this morning, and I said I was giving a 10-minute uh, speech at lunchtime, and her response was, well, that'll be a first. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see how I go uh, in uh, 10 minutes. Now, Australia wants uh, a tax system that is sustainable and fair, where people choose to participate because they have trust and confidence uh, in the system and its administration. 
A sustainable system is also a resilient one. So what are the features, from my point of view, of a resilient tax system? It is one that is designed for the majority, where we administer based on risk, transparency and behaviour, knowing that most taxpayers are doing the right thing and make it easy to participate by offering contemporary tailored services. A resilient tax system is one that fosters willing participation, where people have belief in the system, a sense that everyone is paying the right amount and the administration is fair and has integrity. It's also a system that is responsive and adaptable to trends, threats and opportunities, where community, business, the tax profession, government and the ATO work together to understand the global environment, explore opportunities and mitigate risks domestically and internationally. So, designed for the majority, what do we mean here? People's attitudes to participating in the tax system are influenced by many factors. Belief in taxes, trust in the fairness and integrity of the administration, the, 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 the actual structure of the system, such as our pay-as-you-go systems, dividend franking, and of course the, de the deterrent effect of compliance enforcement actions. We know the economy, industry practices, business and social settings also influence people's behaviour. Most people do do the right thing and willingly participate because more than 95% of the revenue we collect comes in through the mere existence of the tax system. Only 5% of the revenue we collect comes in through active compliance measures. So our intent is to design and administer systems for the majority of people who do do the right thing. That means making it easier for those people and providing a lighter touch experience. We are currently looking at our levels of resourcing across the ATO to see if they align with this 95-5 concept. We also have the challenge of reshaping and rebalancing our workforce after our fairly significant voluntary redundancy process to ensure that we have the right amount of effort in the right places. Now, even uh, with these uh, resource challenges, we are forging ahead with our contemporary service offer. We're looking at new products and services that will make things easier. Some examples. We've now got uh, an app for uh, individuals, for small business, and uh, uh, for superannuation. 80% of the users have uh, rated the app a four or five star rating, and the feedback uh, has been incredibly positive. Also, to be able to tailor and link in a lot of the YouTube product we have, rather than that densely tight, tight sort of text information that traditionally we would send out, people do want to see a two or three minute explanation in a very quick way at their convenience. We now have MyTax uh, available via MyGov, where we have a new simplified tax return for people with straightforward tax affairs. More than 2.2 million people have now linked uh, to the ATO via MyGov and over 750,000 people have already prepared their returns using this streamlined uh, MyTax uh, product. Some people saying they've been able to do it in three to five to ten minutes because of the extensive pre-fill uh, all available to them. We have also developed a variety of channels for small businesses. We've got an on online newsroom. We've got a small business assist on our website where you can type in a question to get an answer back. We've got after-hour callback services available from 6 to 9, Monday to Friday. We're now piloting a click-to-chat facility on the web. We've got face-to-face -face visits. We've got regional liaison offices appointed uh, outside the major uh, capital city centres. Rather than the old paradigm that we had, the only way you could interact with the tax office was to use a call centre or actually to write a letter. So providing a whole range of channels. Uh, for people to choose uh, what is better for them. We're focusing very much on having uh, much more early engagement, uh, particularly in applications for rulings and in finalising some of the larger aged uh, case disputes. And for example, cycle times for private rulings have reduced from an average of 129 days to an average of 40 days just by simply sitting down with people up front 
to understand more the issues rather than doing this very lengthy paper process through an application, response, questions, uh, uh, etc. We have made a concerted effort uh, to finalise age cases either through settlement or if we cannot reach any uh, uh, position near settlement, simply going to court rather than continually sort of admiring the problem that uh, we both have. We've also used, uh, in this sense, increased use of uh, Alternative Dispute Resolution, ADR, and uh, the negotiated settlements have increased substantially since 2012-13 uh, uh, to this year. And this is not simply about doing deals, but um, about having appropriate settlement and closure. And we use in-house facilitators now for the smaller uh, dispute cases in GST and uh, income tax, and uh, right through to retired federal and high court judges for the much larger major uh, uh, large business case sectors. We're also piloting a new process called external compliance assurance, assurance process, where taxpayers uh, who have a turnover of between $100 million and $5 billion annually <coughs> Uh, have the option of using their existing statutory auditor to undertake assurance work to us on matters that are of interest to us. Now, this is not about technical interpretation of the tax law, but simply assuring us around certain factual matters. Again, instead of us asking for all contracts, documents, correspondence, emails pertaining to whatever the matter is and boxes of material come, if the statutory auditor has already gone through that for the purposes of uh, the statutory accounts, uh, they can assure us of certain factual matters. Now, a light touch experience for the majority needs to be accompanied, obviously, with the right level of attention on the compliance enforcement for those who are not doing the right thing. So designing for the 95% that I spoke of does not mean ignoring the 5%. And the work we are doing to address the cash economy risks and in the BEPS area are good examples of where, uh, uh, where there are challenging behaviour and we are taking appropriate action. Now, fostering willing participation. At the tax office, we have set uh, new directions to 2020 in a statement about our mission and vision. Now, our new mission is, and I quote, to contribute to the economic and social wellbeing of Australians by fostering willing participation in the tax and super systems. A few words there are very key, this notion of fostering willing participation. What is willing participation? What is participation in a tax system? How do you foster or increase that participation? How can we affect the position in Australia where people consciously want to do the right thing? So what our view now is, is that when we look at that 95% that comes in through the mere existence of the system, all the legislation, all the regulation, a uh, significant proportion of the investment is all focused towards the 5%. So those people that have a demonstrable history of willing compliance year in, year out, have to go through a more complex, more time-consuming, more painful, more expensive experience because all of the law and regulation is designed for the 5%. And I should say, this is not simply a matter limited to uh, the taxation uh, area, but uh, government regulation more generally. So the ATO's role is to give people confidence that the system is administered in the most effective and efficient way, and that everyone is paying their fair share. We know that from experience and research that there's a strong correlation between levels of trust and confidence and levels of willing participation. We also know that positive client experiences, great service and strong relationships do make a big difference. This means we have to change the way we are working to a client and relationship basis focus. It is a transformation that we call at the tax office reinventing the ATO. We need to shift our mindsets from revenue protection to facilitating compliance, from risk aversion to risk management, from silo to whole of system thinking, from shared accountability to individual accountability, from task to relationship, from process to outcome focus, from internal to external uh, focus. If we can achieve these mindset and behavioural shifts, not only will we provide a better experience for clients, we'll be able to provide better quality advice to Treasury to influence policy and law design. 
Now, just briefly, because I've been given the nine-minute warning on responsive and uh, uh, adapt uh, adaptable, I should mention that the international tax architecture in place today was designed in the industrial age, where goods and services were simply delivered in a local marketplace. Today, greater economic integration across borders, improvements in communications technology, reduced barriers to international trade, the increasing value of intellectual property, and the integration of developing economies in the global value chain has fundamentally changed the way businesses operate. A business can move its intangible and financial assets around the world and earn revenues from customers in countries where it has no physical presence, maximising return on capital simply through aggressive tax structuring. Australia does have strong transfer pricing, general anti-avoidance, thin capitalisation, and controlled foreign corporation rules that do provide defences against BEPS risks. However, the taxation of cross-border structures and transactions, especially between international related parties, can be a challenging issue even within the existing guidelines, legislation and treaties. Action is needed on this front because, four points and I'll finish. One, Australia's current tax system relies more on corporate income tax than all other countries other than Norway. An uneven international playing field may harm the competitiveness of Australian businesses' long-term prosperity. The global reaction to avoidance could result in breakout of, un, of, sorry, of unilateral action taken by other jurisdictions and increase the risk or incidence of double taxation. And to go back to my earlier point about willing participation, Lack of action could result in a lack of trust in the legitimacy of the tax system. A perception of unfairness has the potential to undermine the voluntary ethic in the broader tax system. So there's a lot on, uh, and we at the tax office can't sit still. The ATO does have a critical role in ensuring Australia has a resilient tax system. We will do what we can that is within our control. We will adapt, improve, and move with the times. I have been incredibly fortunate that the Commissioner has given me a wonderful segue into what I'm going to speak about because obviously there's been a great deal of publicity around the problem in our international tax regime as well as the role of the G20 and the OECD, the, the role that they were playing in addressing these BEPS problems. So I'm going to briefly speak to you about regulatory reform in relation to the G20. And if you are involved in this at all, you, you'd be eagerly awaiting the first of the OECD BEPS recommendations that is released at 10 p.m. tonight. So if you're up at 10 p.m. tonight, <laughs> Uh, much better things to do than watch television. Now, I'll go back to what Treasurer Joe Hockey uh, said on the 4th of September. Mostly positive statements uh, when he considered resilience in our international tax regime. He made a few statements that I'm going to read out to you. He told Parliament that the Commissioner of Taxation has been asked to double his efforts to stamp out profit shifting by conducting more extensive inquiries and audits of multinational companies considered a risk to Australian tax collections. He then went on and said, there is a small proportion of multinational businesses that set up sophisticated arrangements to avoid Australian tax. This is patently unfair, unfair on the Australian taxpayer and unfair on local businesses that are doing the right thing. Finally, Another statement, this government won't stand idly by while this is happening. We are firmly committed to ensuring that Australia is paid on profit, uh, Australian tax is paid on profits in Australia. General public may consider these statements positive, and that is very much a truncated version of the speech to Parliament, and I've extracted what are quite sensationalist parts of, of the speech. But I would actually argue from the tone of the speech that if we are to genuinely ensure resilience in our international tax regime, there are three key flaws in those statements. First, it is uh, very Australian focused, and that deals with the issue of fiscal sovereignty. 
Fiscal sovereignty is central to any international tax issue. But we need to increasingly ask ourselves what we mean by fiscal sovereignty because a unilateral stance isn't tenable. So fiscal sovereignty isn't just about a right to design the tax regime any way we want. It also uh, holds an obligation, a duty and an obligation to protect and promote the welfare of our citizens. And that can be done not necessarily through competition with other nations, but also with collaboration to avoid that race to the bottom. So in my view, a resilient tax system is one in which we recognise that there are both rights and obligations attached to fiscal sovereignty. And our obligations extend beyond the domestic level to a global level. If we don't start thinking globally, our obligations to taxpayers are not met. It doesn't mean we don't hold on to our core values. I firmly believe that we do hold on to our core tax values. Second, the Treasurer has suggested that the ATO has the job of stamping out tax avoidance. It's up to Parliament to legislate a robust and adaptable international tax regime. It's not up to the Commissioner of Taxation to stamp out, which is what is probably legal. And the BEPS OECD uh, reports state this. The, uh, the multinationals are complying with the law. It just happens to be considered profit shifting because we have a broken international tax system. Now, morality of these multinationals is another question. And for the sake of time, I won't go into the morality issues. But in, in the context of um, audits, etc., and cases, we've seen <coughs> these kind of cases fail. We saw a transfer pricing case, uh, which was run, and the commissioner lost. And it resulted in our transfer pricing laws being amended. What did we do? We actually ended up embedding the OECD transfer pricing guidelines into our current regime. Uh, we've seen a failure in terms of TPG Maya with private equity exits, if you followed the media on that. Um, we don't know the answer to the TPG Maya case, uh, which involved the use of tax treaties. Because the money had left the country. There wasn't much more we could do. But do we really want to be running Part 4A cases when the problem is with the substantive law, our treaty provisions which are allowing these things to happen? Thirdly, uh, the Treasurer talks about an unfair result. Maybe it's the semantics of an academic, but I think unfair is the wrong word to be using, and I was so pleased to see the Commissioner talking about fairness, because that is a very different concept to saying that the system is unfair because people aren't paying their fair share. We're talking about fairness, and I absolutely agree that at a grassroots level, fairness is the core, uh, core to a robust tax system. But in a global economy, it's not just about ensuring Australia receives its fair share, but that all nations receive their fair share. Developed countries, developing countries. Um, Fairness also needs to be considered as a concept. Miranda's giving me the sign. I'll finish. Um, what do we mean by fairness? And I think what we're saying is that if companies are making sales here, they're earning profits here, it's fair that we get some of the tax. And that is the root of our, our international tax regime. So where does that leave us? Paul Abbey, I'm hoping, will provide an insight into the PwC series on protecting our prosperity with their latest report talking about how we fix a tax system. But that report actually talks about some key points in relation to what we must do. And I'll, I'll list three. Governments must take a stand and make it clear as to their position on tax reform. And that means making hard decisions. Second, all options need to be on the table. We can't limit our discussions. And thirdly, and I think the Commissioner made this point in talking about fostering willing participation, Everyone must have the opportunity to be involved. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and thanks, Miranda, for inviting me along. And um, I don't know which joke to start with. No such thing as a free lunch. Uh, <laughs> inevitability of death and taxes. And, uh, 
Australians don't care about tax. Well, you know, today's uh, event uh, blows a few myths away. Um, look, uh, so my name's Richard Dennis. Uh, I'm from the Australian Institute. I I'm an economist, so apologies. I seem to be in a room full of accountants and lawyers. And people usually disagree with me, but they particularly disagree with me when they're accountants and lawyers. Um, so I'll talk about economics. I'll leave accountancy and law to you guys. Um, I hate to say it, but I think the uh, resilience uh, shares the Latin root of the word resile, uh, which is to run away from. Uh, so if we want a resilient tax system, could be me, could be my mum, really. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure that we actually want uh, a system that we resile from. Uh, I want a system that we embrace. Uh, I like tax. Uh, I like paying it. Indeed, I think I pay more than I'm required to, uh, entirely voluntarily. Now, I'm an economist. <laughs> no, I, 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 I disagree. I, I know lots of people like me. In fact, my organisation is funded philanthropically. Every cent that the Australian Institute gets is given to us by people who get nothing in exchange except some loudmouth pushing for higher taxes. <laughs> so this idea, this economic assumption that rational individuals always want to pay the lowest price is contradicted by history and evidence. It's great fun, and greedy people love to tell everybody that that's normal. But my organisation wouldn't exist if there weren't lots of people who actually want to pay for good service. I pay more tax probably than I have to. My accountant tells me that anyway. I also pay far more for lunch than I need to because I like good service. You know, I could make my own sandwich. But look, you offer a free one and some of you guys show up. <laughs> right. But I actually pay far more for lunch each day than I need to. I used to work at a petrol station. That's how I got through uni. And I would watch people do a U-turn over a double yellow line on the rare day that we were half a centilitre cheaper than the people on the other side. And they'd risk a $200 fine, put 40 litres of petrol in their car and save themselves how much? 20 cents. And then pay 10 bucks a litre for bottled water. Now, I know you wouldn't do that, right? But other people are that stupid. Well, I'm one of them because I pay more tax than I need to. And we need a tax system for a simple reason, that we need a health system, we need an education system, we need a transport system, and these days it seems we need a military system. These things cost us a lot of money. And if you don't like them, then you don't like tax. But if you do like them, then a rational individual, of which I think I'm one, must like tax. That's it, we need tax reform. Uh, it's very rare to hear someone disagree with that statement. It's very hard, however, to get people to agree on what the hell that might be. I think tax reform would be collecting more tax. I'm like Menzies. All right? Menzies increased the tax to GDP take quite substantially. Remember him? He was a lefty pinko. All right? And tax to GDP rose quite steadily. He also ran deficits for his last nine years. History is not all that we think it is. Now, unfortunately, in Australia, debate about tax reform often hinges on debate about the GST. And should we have a GST of 12%, 15%? Couldn't care less. Let me just put it to you this way. If the answer to, tax, if the, answer to the question is increasing the GST, then it can't be a very interesting question. All right, you increase the GDP from 10 to 12%, you'll collect yourself, what, another 5, 7 billion a year? Who cares? That's rounding error. Okay, we spend $40 billion a year on tax concessions for superannuation. If you think we can fix the tax system with the GST, then I think you're asking little, tiny questions. Okay, Australia is one of the richest countries in the world, living at the richest point in world history. We have one of the lowest tax to GDP ratios in the developed world. If you think we're high tax, then you are wrong internationally and you are wrong historically. You might be right morally, because I don't know what the moral answer to how much tax we should pay is, but we don't pay very much. And if, and it's a big if, you want to spend more on health, education, you want to tackle climate change, and you want to have a war overseas, you're going to have to spend some more money on tax or admit that you don't really want to do some of those things. Now, 
time. I'll just end with this. The GST might have made sense, and I don't hate the GST, I'm glad we've got it, but increasing it bores me. Um, increasing, the, the, the GST was going to end the black economy. Do you remember that? We were going to scrap. There was going to be no cash economy after the GST came in. It actually gives produce, service sector providers and consumers more reason to avoid tax, not less. And 20 years ago, we thought that consumption was geographically confined. We thought labour might be mobile, and profits certainly are, but we knew consumption was right here. Has anyone heard of the internet? <laughs> right, the GST might have been a great idea 20 years ago. It's made the black economy bigger, and there's nothing geographically confined about consumption anymore. Tax reform is bigger than the GST. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for attending this afternoon. I'm very, <coughs> I have to say, I'm very impressed as a former, actually a former student of this university, and, and in fact, someone who grew up in Canberra and was born in Canberra. It's so impressive to see so many Canberrans come out for a subject like this this afternoon. Um, I'm. The commissioners talked about administration of the system. I think Kerry's talked about the corporate tax system in many ways. Um, Richard's just talked. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought I'd talk about um, tax reform. Uh, Miranda's definition of resilience is very interesting in that she dis dis discusses the thing about being adaptable and being robust and being able to recover quickly because the challenge for our tax system in many of those qualities is about to arise. If you think about what our tax system is meant to achieve, you, you might say in particular three things. The first thing which I think Richard actually touched upon is the fact that it needs to be able to deliver sufficient revenue so that government can provide all the services that we want to obtain. The second thing it needs to do is it needs to provide some measure of equity. Now it can do that either in a redistributive way or it can also do that in, in the way of capability, and capability is actually what you're demonstrating here today. The tax system, or by raising taxes and allowing us to have a sophisticated education system, means that we can create social mobility, we can improve the quality of people's lives by educating them and giving them access to better jobs. And so the tax system delivers the revenue to provide that piece of equity. And then the other thing the tax system needs to do is the tax system needs to do all of that in an economically efficient way. The tax system doesn't of itself generate economic efficiency, but if it's structured in the wrong way, it can harm the way our economy operates. And if it does that, then the job opportunities provided, the work opportunities, the incomes for the people who are part of that economy are constrained. So we need to be conscious of those issues when we develop our, and structure our tax system. So if you look at this country right now in regard to our tax system, and you take up Richard's challenge of why do we need reform, there are two particular challenges we have to think about. The first challenge is our ability to deliver revenue. In recent years, our tax system, and especially post-GFC, our tax system has failed to deliver sufficient revenue for the delivery of services. And so our governments at state and federal level have run deficits, and they've grown their debt levels compared to what those debt levels were pre-GFC. And so we can continue on that path and we can accumulate more debt, but there will be a point in time where economically that will become a palatable situation for us as a country. And so the first challenge that we need to embrace is to think about how we structure our tax system to deliver the sufficient revenue we need to finance the services we intend to obtain from government. And then the second challenge which is thrown at us in regard to our tax system right now, <coughs> excuse me, is the fact that our living standards have suddenly faced a challenge. And that challenge has been because we have lived upon what you hear referred to a lot as terms of trade for the past 10 years. But those terms of trade existed in when we had a mining, sorry, I should say an iron ore price of $130 plus a tonne. And now we have an iron ore price of $80 or approaching $80 a tonne. And you wonder why I talk about that but the health of the corporate tax system in Australia is actually not necessarily going to be driven by what happens in regard to international taxes and base erosion and profit shifting. The health of the corporate tax system in Australia, the corporate tax system, is driven more by the iron ore price than by any other feature. 
If the iron ore price rises by approximately $10 per tonne over the course of a year, that is $2 billion within the corporate tax system. So a reduction in the iron ore price of an average $50 a tonne over the course of a year would be a $10 billion loss for a corporate tax system which did only collect $60 billion. So the challenge for our economy and the challenge for us now is that what drove our incomes, which was our terms of trade, the price at which we sell things compared to the price at which we buy things, has collapsed. And what we need to ensure that national incomes continue to grow at the rate they've grown over the past 20 years, which is a rate of income growth of approximately 2% per annum, what we need to do that is we need to drive the things in our economy which are going to make our economy perform strongly and that is in particular labour participation and labour productivity. And the tax system impacts upon those things. Does the tax system encourage you to go to work or discourage you to go to work? And then in the work you do, does the tax system encourage the economy to be structured in a way to make that work as productive as possible? And that's what we need the tax system to do. We need to do those two things well so that we drive up and ensure the continuing growth of incomes across the entire economy. And so that system, or those challenges, are our challenge for the next year, because our federal government has announced that it wants to conduct a tax reform process. It will do that tax reform process through the release of a green paper and a white paper. Those papers will set out proposed changes to our tax system. Those changes will undoubtedly address the challenges which I've described to you. And then the challenge which arises to us is to be sufficiently flexible in our political process that we can embrace making change to our tax system which will ensure that it is sufficiently adaptable and sufficiently robust to deliver on the promises that it needs to meet of ensuring sufficient revenue for the delivery of services and ensuring a healthy and vibrant economy. Time. <laughs> I feel like I've done my job. They've all presented and they've kept to time, so I can leave and you can talk to me yourselves. No, now we move on to what I hope is we've got plenty of time. We've, we've got uh, more than half an hour to really have uh, good uh, engagement and discussion. I have promised my panelists because of because I forced them to such short periods of time that I will throw back to them uh, to perhaps. Uh, deepen uh, some of their comments on a few of these issues at some point. But I would um, be very happy, first of all, to open it up and to see if anyone would like to start with questions or comments uh, to get us going. So I've got one down here, so please wait for the mic. Probably what I'll do is I might take a couple at a time and then uh, sort of throw to the panel or come back to me. So one down here. Is there anyone else who'd like to? Ask something or make a comment after this one? Just raise your hand if you do. If you could say where you're from, that where your name and where you're from, that would be great. Izzy Nikoski, I'm a student here at the Crawford School. Um, my question was about political settings for the whole tax reform process. Uh, I noticed that none of you mentioned the other green paper, white paper process, of course, which is about federalism. And it seems to me there's a very close correlation between the work that needs to be undertaken in this context, which is, of course, tax system and the way in which it interacts with the way in which our federal system works and also needs to be changed. I was just wondering whether anyone had any comments on the extent to which those two things need to happen in lockstep. Thank you. Uh, so the comment was about um, federalism, links between uh, tax reform and federalism. So we might just take, see if someone else has another comment or question um, before we... Oh, uh, up the back. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to just make a suggestion. Isn't tax sovereignty fundamentally like all sovereignty territorial? And therefore, maybe we should go back to Adam Smith and consider there's only three things you can tax in the end. Incomes from land, labor, or capital. And there's only one of them that can't run away, die out, wear out, or hide itself in a bank account. Uh, would that be land? <laughs> <laughs> just checking. <laughs> 
um, the good point about mobility and sovereignty. So we, I might come back to see if anyone would like to jump in first, Kerry, and then Richard perhaps. Go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to address the second question first. Um, absolutely. I, I think we need to be a little more sophisticated than that in, in terms of sovereignty. But what you're really talking about in the sense of tax fairness is looking at what we want to tax. So getting back to the international tax regime, what we're saying is we want to tax where sales are happening, uh, where labour is occurring, etc. So they are very much the Adam Smith principles. So are the fairness issues that we're talking about. And I did make a comment that uh, we need to stick to those fundamental norms of, of tax. We keep increasing the complexity of our system and then we keep putting band-aids over that system. So I think you make a very valid point that we need to go back to those fundamentals and think about the building blocks for a robust, robust tax system. Yeah, look, I, I agree and I, I try and join the two. I, I think that the, the, the economics of tax reform are entirely unrelated to the politics of tax reform. And the politics of tax reform these days are uh, maintenance of the status quo for groups that are powerful enough to prevent change. So, uh, you know, we just saw a, a resource rent tax, perfectly good tax, uh, collecting revenue from an immobile resource. In fact, we were taxing it as we tried to make it mobile, that is when you profit from digging it up and selling it. Uh, and uh, even though we've got a government complaining about budget deficits, it's just scrapped a perfectly good and entirely economically efficient tax. So uh, whether it's uh, a debate about federalism or whether it's a debate about the basis of tax we should choose, and of course as an economist uh, I disagree slightly, I think a uh, tax system can increase the efficiency of the tax, uh, the efficiency of the economy when you tax bad things. Well, if you believe in climate change, you'd sort of think shifting the tax base towards pollution and shifting the tax base towards uh, resource rent profits uh, would make sense. But it gets caught up in federalism and it gets caught up in groups that are powerful enough to veto change. So, yeah, of course, we can have a white paper about federalism and, yep, we can talk about land tax and and resource rent taxes, but let's be clear, in Australia today, you're not going to get any change that upsets a powerful group. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> gave me a slight heart attack, not going to get any change. I'll prove um, you wrong, though. <laughs> I'm an optimist by nature, a glass half full person. Paul or Chris, do you want to respond to either of those points? Oh, I was, well, in response to the first question, I was just going to say that um, it is it is the government's intention that the tax reform process and the federalism process do run hand in hand. If you look at the terms of reference for the federalism process, there are elements in the terms of reference there which concern the tax basis of states. Uh, last week the government put out the first discussion paper in regard to the federalism process and in that discussion paper there's discussion, there are uh, chapters which concern the, the tax basis of the states and there's chapters which also concern horizontal fiscal equity, the desire to ensure that between the states we have the same level of service provided out of government services. So it is very true that those things need to run together. And probably the broader, the broader comment to make about that is, and it, and it relates a bit to the, to the second question, is that it, when you think about the tax system, you need to ensure that you don't always just think about... Um, the income tax system, and particularly the income tax system as it applies to corporations, the tax system is a multifaceted thing, and there's not just the taxation paid by corporations, which in Australia is about $60 billion, as I said, of the taxes that we collect. We collect about $420 or $430 billion annually of tax, and the income tax system on individuals is about 160 but then there's about 50 of GST, and then there's a whole range of other things, land taxes, uh, payroll taxes, um, mining royalties, there's a, there's a huge range. And when we come to talk about tax reform, what we need to um, keep in mind, notwithstanding um, Richard's um, um, disappointment he's going to experience soon and there's no change, but what we, need, what we need to keep in mind is that what we need to actually do is think about each one of those taxes and the efficiency or the effectiveness of each one of those taxes, and then we need to keep in mind how we structure 
delivering the necessary revenue between those taxes to get the best possible outcome. And that's what the federalism process is in part about, and that's what the tax reform process is also about. So they are connected in that way. So just, uh, you're quite right about that white paper. The issues paper, I think, probably went up on Friday night at midnight. I saw it was dated the 12th, which was Friday. But that first white paper issues uh, paper is now out mm -hmm. in, in federalism. There are no terms of reference issued for the white paper on tax reform. Uh, and it, it seems that that uh, may not happen. Uh, that there'll be a series of uh, discussion points or issues papers and a green paper in this, in this political and policy process. Um, Questions? Or, oh, we've got one. Fleur, yes? Thank you. Um, Mr. Jordan, you mentioned before that uh, there really needs to be a multilateral approach to BEPs and transfer pricing and the consequences of if that doesn't happen. Uh, I wondered whether you could explain how the common reporting standard will work for Australia um, in terms of clamping that down and whether you think that it is possible to ever get a really a multinational response to it when there's benefits for those countries that don't sign up to it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. just, I might just repeat, yeah. just so that uh, I'm sure you heard was amplified, but really about this new uh, administrative cooperative process that's part of the, the OECD base erosion profit shifting project. Maybe you could actually just briefly say what the process is uh, as well, just to make sure that people know. Yes, uh, the, the automatic exchange of information is one of the three sort of major planks of the G20 tax agenda uh, uh, this year and I would suggest probably for, for a year or two at least uh, more. Um, and uh, a part of this was uh, driven by the US, uh, they had this uh, FATCA, a Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act or something like that which required uh, any uh, financial institution uh, registered or raising funds in the US to provide information to the US in terms of the tax residency or the people who had deposits with them wherever it was in the world. So that was sort of a, a, a useful thing for, for uh, US uh, purposes uh, to get that information. So that's been broad and there's a similar sort of thing within the EU uh, already exchanging of information of the tax domicile of the account holders of financial institutions. So this has been broadened out to uh, uh, a large number of uh, countries now, I think like 100 or 110 <coughs> countries have signed up uh, uh, expressing intent to uh, adopt a common reporting standard. So uh, the, the, the beauty of this is um, you can transfer bulk data between uh, countries and that's sort of useful, but uh, very manual. If it's not in a particular format, every piece of information or bulk information you get, you've got to drill down in, and it's an incredibly labour-intensive uh, sort of uh, process. So what it is, is uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's a lot more than the US factor. It's extending the EU to be uh, basically automatic exchange of information using a common platform that we here in the ATO and any revenue authority uh, in any country can then design their system around that platform. So we can run the analytics over the top of it, draw out what information we need, match it against anything else that we have. Uh, we're getting a lot better with the uh, vast amount of data we are, a lot better at using that information in terms of profiling people but also aggregating. It's one thing to say, well, what do we know about you? But when we know everything about you, your associates, your family members, your entities, uh, trusts that you're a beneficiary of, that's quite a different picture. So this is an important piece of uh, that overall puzzle to basically get data in a format that we can easily manipulate. Uh, I think it will be uh, quite, uh, quite well supported in the uh, forthcoming G20. It's simply a matter of the timing, you know, what year are people going to sort of start the reporting of this, uh, the, this information. There are some in Europe that are starting as early as 2016 because they're pretty much the systems are there anyway. Uh, it's a lot easier to adapt the whole system. In Australia, we've never really had to do this. Some of the large banks were, were uh, well advanced in the FATCA reporting but the common reporting standard in this exchange of information goes beyond the traditional large banks. It does hit some of the insurance companies, 
uh, and some of these other um, uh, bodies that weren't originally uh, caught up in the fact. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a useful uh, piece of information, uh, yes. uh, so one... mainly, for, mainly for individuals, uh, to be sort of useful for corporations to actually understand the flows to where monies end up. So if there's a lot of money sitting in a, a particular tax haven that we didn't really know about previously, that might be of interest. But the most major impact of this will be on individuals who have attempted to sort of put money offshore uh, and not disclose the return on that. Uh, we've uh, announced a, a project called uh, Project Do It, which is disclose offshore income today, uh, which runs All of you through... out there, did you hear that? <laughs> disclose offshore, offshore income, income today. today. Uh, which uh, runs until the, about the middle of December because uh, our view is we will eventually, we've now tracked it out, we're through this uh, uh, exchange of information or we've signed uh, uh, a new tax treaty with Switzerland last year that provides for the first time for the exchange of uh, information. So we've said, look, let's do it quicker, sooner, uh, provide a concessional base for you come forward uh, and we'll tax you on the last four years of income, put a flat 10% penalty on and charge you the normal interest uh, uh, charge on that, but bring the assets back into the system. So one of those things that uh, that very powerful administrative cooperation raises for me is one of the tensions in the system about how the individual and individual privacy and taxpayer rights sit with um, collaborative uh, revenue agencies. I'm a fan of automatic information exchange, but I do think this is one of the tensions for legitimacy in our system. Uh, we might feel confident, reasonably confident, uh, about uh, Australia's privacy settings for, for individuals, but we might feel a little more concerned uh, about that for, for other countries. The other tension that it raises, and we've got another question coming here, is uh, that, of course, it relies on financial intermediaries, right? So you need banks and financial intermediaries to be in the system for this, this to operate. But what if you have Bitcoin transactions which take place outside financial intermediaries? So you can see that there is a temptation and a tension there, certainly a temptation for creative development uh, to kind of then again potentially move outside systems. Uh, but I do think this is a very impressive uh, achievement if this comes out of the D20. Uh, now, we have another question here. Yeah. This question is very Australia focused, um, but a big feature of our Australian social structure is the um, shifting demographic, the ageing population. Richard made a very brief uh, reference to our superannuation system, but with the emphasis on equity uh, throughout the uh, presentations, I just wonder whether any members of the panel would have some comments you know, about that feature of our society at the moment, showing that the aged and fewer women. Yeah. coming through and um, whether uh, superannuation arrangements, you know, need this. So the comment about um, demographic change, the ageing of the population, the, the cost to revenue of that and also potentially the, the, the fairness and efficiency <coughs> implications. Um, yeah, so you were referred to, Richard, shall we throw to you and then... Yeah, look, I, I think that our, uh, our superannuation system uh, is fundamentally broken and in 20 years' time will not resemble anything like what it looks like today. Uh, that said, you've got an industry that's making more than $20 billion in fees that are pretty determined to keep the status quo the same. Now, it's interesting, the, uh, it costs seven times more to administer our superannuation system than it costs to administer the entire tax system. So, well done. Um, the, the total administration... Well, you're doing well. No, seriously, the, the transaction costs uh, of, of the tax system are remarkably small compared to the incredibly expensive coupon clipping that is the superannuation system. So, uh, we've got uh, tax concessions next year will be greater... Tax concessions to super next year will be greater than the entire cost of the age pension. We saw Joe Hockey admit that he now accepts, as Treasury always has, he's just the first Treasurer to say it, that the number of, or the percentage of people on the age pension will be no lower in 30 years' time than it is today. What the superannuation system is, is simultaneously a wonderful middle-class top-up to the age pension, top-up, not substitute, uh, and the best legal tax minimisation strategy ever invented. 
Because if you're over 65, you can pull millions of dollars out of super entirely tax-free. I mean, this is a fantastic system. Why would you go to Switzerland? Why would you go to the Bahamas? If you could engineer $100 million in your self-managed super fund, and we know at least one person has, then you can pull $10 million a year out tax-free. Fantastic. Not going to last, and the industry is going to fight tooth and nail to keep that $20 billion transaction cost. And could I just uh, uh, add a comment uh, on that? You know, I talked about designing the system for the majority, right, for 95%. And I think this debate has skewed somewhat. Uh, we're the ATO regulators uh, of the Supplement Superfund area. Um, you know, there are limits on what does go in annually. If someone has hit a jackpot somewhere and got $100 million uh, uh, in their super fund, well, you know, good luck. Um, there's 550,000 super funds, right, uh, self-managed super funds. Uh, the average member balance is 480,000. So 5% return, that's 24,000 a year. Now, I'd hardly say that's wealthy or, or, or you know, extravagant uh, in it. There's 1.5% of super funds have assets between five and 10 million, right? So 500,000 super funds have assets below $2 million, right? Now, so the average fund balance is $930,000. The average member balance, because many of those funds have at least two members. So the average member balance is 480,000. So where's the majority, where's the 95% of design for the system that I'm talking about? It's with those people. It's with people that might get a $24,000 return on retirement. You know, and so I, I do sort of, let's be careful about shaping a tax system for one person, self-managed super fund. If someone somehow got an advantage, good luck to them. Let's stick with the people, the majority, the 500,000 plus. So I'd just be a little careful, because like, uh, uh, Jennifer Hewitt wrote this article, she does the page two of the Fin Review on the 28th of August, where she systematically went through and debunked a whole lot of this. Uh, the Treasury costings, for example, the Shoon and Treasury themselves say they are a guess at, at what this is. It assumes that if there was no money in the surplus, people would simply pay full marginal rates, 49% tax on that. Whereas people will clearly do something else, negative here, whatever, right? Uh, you might say, well, you should do something there, but that's a different. But that's a different argument. No, that's it's a, not. That's it's a different report. argument. No, that's a different. Well, yeah, but, but but I just want to make sure this super thing, because I read this so often, that the wealthy are getting a big advantage here, and I look at the figures, and when I look at this stand back, let's design things for the majority. This is a classic example. I've got to respond. The right. average Australian has less than two legs. Okay. The number of one-legged people is far greater than the number of three-legged people. And in turn, the average Australian has less than, less than two legs. The average is irrelevant. We're talking about the fact that very wealthy Australians have been handed an incredible tax minimisation gift in the superannuation industry. And more than half of Australians will retire with less than $150,000 in super. All right? More than half. Women who take, are silly enough to choose to take time out of the workforce to care for kids, women who are silly enough to choose to take time out of the workforce to care for adults, will retire with far less in super. And perversely, if the current government's uh, reform agenda is complete, low-income earners will pay more tax, more tax on their super contributions than they will on their very low ordinary income. You could not design a system that does more to take from those with the least and give to those with the most. And to defend that system by saying, ah, oh, there's only a handful, only four or five percent making out like bandits, I think, I hope you keep that defence up. I hope the industry runs that line because that will speed up change quite a bit. Right, oh, I'll just stick to my design for the majority. <laughs> As an administrator, you're administering for the 95% of the time. Now, we did have a question over here. Thank you. Peter Sutherland, College of Law. I'd like to address something to the Commissioner. I think Richard might also be interested in commenting. Um, mentioned fairness. Uh, there's a Commonwealth agency called Centrelink, which 
prosecutes low-income sole parents who have been about fifteen thousand dollars. That, that that is the policy. My experience as a lawyer at the tax office is they negotiate debts of hundreds of thousands of dollars in a commercial sense. They will accept the bankruptcy with a low level rate of recovery, or they negotiate to avoid the bankruptcy and write off debts in the, in the vicinity of hundreds of thousands of dollars for individuals. Where's the equity in that? So again, just to repeat that uh, for everyone, the issue really is the different enforcement and compliance approach that we take in our two big cash in, cash out systems, leaving super aside for a minute, I guess, uh, being social security system compared to the tax system. So that is a question for yeah, you, Commissioner, I, but then we might... I don't know, I don't in know what the situation use. in Centrelink is, so I can't uh, comment on that. Uh, what we do at the tax office is try to work with uh, uh, small businesses in particular. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, debt around the small business and their quarterly instalments. Uh, we try to work with them, A, to make sure they don't get into debt. Uh, B, how can, can we work with you? If your business is viable, how can we work with you to get yourself out of that debt? Um, I'm very strong on the basis that my primary aim is not to bankrupt people, not to put people out of business if they have a viable uh, business to run and if uh, typically people get themselves into trouble because of large one-off events, either in their life as individuals uh, or uh, for businesses that they haven't quite monitored their operations. So uh, we, we try to work with people to stay in the system uh, rather than work uh, to sort of penalise people and bankrupt people. So that's not our primary aim. How do we make people stay in the system, work with us jointly, A, to get out, not to get in the debt in the beginning, uh, and to provide the relevant amount of information, education and help? Uh, and secondly, uh, if in debt, uh, what sort of arrangement can we come to? Typically, that's a payment uh, uh, arrangement. Um, we, we get criticised, on the other hand, for those people who refuse to work with us, who we do bankrupt or, or uh, put into liquidation. So it's sort of, you know, both ends of the spectrum here, we, we, we get comments around. So we very much try to work with people not to get into debt and to work through the debt. I just want to see if Kerry or Paul would like to make a comment on that. Uh, look, I, I think it's a really important question and I, I applaud uh, the ATO. Uh, I, uh, I run a small business and uh, after our bookkeeper left a couple of years ago, we outsourced our bookkeeping temporarily and didn't put in a BAS. And the first thing that happened was the ATO rang and said, you guys are putting your BAS in on time for the last 15 years. Is everything all right? Can we help? What a fantastic response. Really. Couldn't, couldn't ask for better. Uh, so I think your question highlights something that we don't want to talk about uh, as a society, and that is that decision making in the ATO is made on a on a on a basically on a revenue maximisation model. What's the smart, sensible thing to do? Decision making in welfare, not just in in chasing debts, is explicitly designed to be punitive. Right? We actually want to not just hurt people, but we want people to see that they are hurt, and the more unreasonable the hurt is, the, the kind of more successful the example making was. And the fact that the ATO adopts an entirely different approach, I think makes perfect sense, but it highlights something really important. That, uh, for example, if you were ignorant of your welfare rights and were slow to apply for money that the Parliament says you're entitled to, there is no back pay when it comes to welfare. In the words of Senderling, you're not entitled until you've asked. Whereas if you can retrospectively get your, your tax affairs kind of renegotiated, well, good luck to you. You're a genius. So it's not just when it comes to penalising that there's an incredible asymmetry in the way we deal with the most vulnerable, poorly advised people and the way we deal with the wealthiest, best advised people. I think that's the point I've made. <laughs> and the other, the other thing there, though, is the real issue is not to allow the Centrelink person to get into $15,000 debt. Right? That's, that's the real issue. How did that ever happen in the first place? It's generally Centrelink Well, no, no, what it is... Yeah. What, 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 it, what it normally is, is someone's gone to do some part-time work and, quite rightly at times, citizens think government agencies exchange information. So if Centrelink keep paying someone an amount, they go, I'm entitled to this, government gave it to me. 
uh, not realising that the systems were only run after the year end to match and then throw up, ah, we know you've earned this much from the tax office now, uh, we've overpaid you. Whereas people often quite rightly think, I got given this money, it's, it's mine. You wouldn't have given it to me if I wasn't entitled. So we've got to move to a system with less churn in it, with more real-time data matching, so that that debt never arises. That's the answer to that. Um, there is yeah, a that's part of the truth. Yes, that is the way debt arises, but it is a mixture of error on the part of the and error on the part of the individual. And it would deliver fraud. Yes. You know? yes. But it would be very difficult to maintain those reporting ratios as an individual. And even with respect to fraud, yeah. there's good evidence. There's a big research project being conducted in New Zealand at the moment by uh, researcher Lisa Marriott at Victoria University. An empirical study of the approach to fraud in social security compared to tax in New Zealand. And the, 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 the differences are what you would expect, that uh, very small debts where there, there is accepted to be fault in both cases, fraud in both cases, very small debts are pursued to the nth degree in the social security system in quite punitive circumstances uh, and are, are forgiven or not chased in the tax system because a bigger systemic risk approach uh, is taken. So it's an interesting question for us about our relationship with government and how we see tax and transfer systems operating. Are they always fully integrated or, or not? Um, do we have any more questions or comments on ranchers one up there? We're almost a full business cycle on from the GFC. Um, so I just wanted to uh, hear your thoughts on whether we do have a resilient tax system. And we're also just about to start a, a period of tax reform. So I'm wondering how we go about measuring whether this round of tax reform delivers a more resilient tax system. It's an interesting question about what, what, what would be good tax reform. And I might throw that to each of our panelists, actually, before we we close. In terms of from the GFC and revenue trends, the Parliamentary Budget Office produced a structural report recently where they looked at um, revenue from 1980 onwards, more or less the last 30 years. Uh, and they showed that uh, federal revenue oscillates around an average of 24% of GDP. Uh, and that makes it seem like it's fairly stable. Uh, but actually, if you look at those 30 years, which have been almost entirely of substantial growth, as uh, Paul was saying, substantial income growth, largely in the last decade, especially on the sort of mining terms of trade, uh, we've had, we've, we had substantial increases in revenue in line with growth. And there was a German economist in the 1860s who posited a theory called Wagner's Law. Uh, which is that uh, revenues and spending basically grow with growth. Uh, no one's ever proven or disproven this theory, but it does seem to match the experience of many countries. Uh, what we're seeing more recently, though, is the spending I increases with growth, but revenue is not keeping up. So in my view, we haven't fully recovered from the GSC. It's not surprising we had a dip. But I, I do think there's some potentially some cause for concern because we have had the benefit of a fast-growing economy. As that growth slows, uh, we, we might really struggle then to have enough uh, revenue to cover the kinds of services that we, we want. So for me, tax reform would involve some increase in revenue and what you might have heard is overall uh, package approaches required there. I might throw to the panel, starting with Paul, to respond to that question about resilience past and then after tax reform. Um, look, it's a very good point about the impact of the GFC in regard to the tax system, because if you look at, the, say, the federal tax system, in, a, in the pre-GFC period we had budget surpluses and we had, um, because of the health in particular of the corporate tax system and the, and the personal tax system, we had very strong revenues. Coming out of the GFC, we had a collapse in all of those revenues, but in particular, we had a collapse in GST revenue, and GST revenue as a proportion of GDP has declined uh, over the past five or six years, and, and that's been driven in part by the fact that post-GFC, people tend to save a lot more, whereas pre-GFC and boom times, people consumed a lot more of their, of their income. And so, so we've had... So we've had an impact from the GFC on GST collection and GST collection declining as a percentage of GDP. We've also, because of the mining boom, what's happened in regard to corporate tax revenues is that post-GFC, the corporate tax revenues having declined in the GFC didn't uh, 
federally recover as much as they were otherwise expected to. And probably that's because what the mining boom did was then create a, a huge pool of capital investment. So we've had um, a massive level of capital investment in our mining industry in the past 10 years, especially compared to, say, the past 50 or 60 years. And that has then suppressed um, corporate tax revenues as a result of that happening. So post-GFC, we also don't have um, the same strength in our corporate tax revenues. So, so your, your comment is right that we've had those weaknesses arise. And then the compensation to those weaknesses has essentially been bracket creep, that we've allowed the income tax system to sit um, still, and we've bracket creeped our way into income tax growth in regard to personal taxes. And that's sustained the health of, of the income tax part of the tax system by essentially allowing people to rise in terms of the, the average um, personal income tax rates that they pay. And so all of, those, all of those points go to your very question, which is they are all challenges to the resilience of the current system. And equally, when we move into this reform cycle, to the extent to which we successfully do or don't do this reform cycle, one of the challenges is for each one of those areas, so for, for recovering the amount of corporate tax, for, for trying to recover GST as a percentage of GDP, and then also not rely entirely on income tax growth um, to sustain the health of the tax system and, and be dependent upon that, we need to take on each one of those challenges as part of the tax reform process. Uh, look, I think it's unfortunate that the, uh, the GFC happened just when it did because it conceals, uh, that, that cyclical shock conceals some structural problems. The last thing John Howard did in his term was significantly cut income taxes. You go back 10 years, 14% of Australians were in the top tax bracket, today it's 2%, maybe 3 So don't worry about bracket creep, far fewer people are in the tax, top tax bracket than we've ever had. Uh, so when the terms of trades were on the way up, when the mining boom was on the way up, we made permanent cuts, very expensive cuts to income tax, cumulative cost more than $200 billion. We doubled the assets test for claiming the pension. That's how afraid we were of the cost of ageing. We thought, quick, how can we get a lot more people claiming the pension? That's, you know, and so one of the reasons that tax concessions for super are having so little benefit in terms of savings on pension if we doubled that assets test. Uh, so I don't so we made some long-term structural decisions pre-GFC and some of uh, yes that's true about the massive investment in the mining industry suppressing corporate tax payments, but we're not going to collect as much income tax as we would without those permanent changes. The Pinko lefties at the IMF said that our uh, our fiscal policy changes at the peak of the boom were reckless. Um, you know, I don't think we've got structural problems with the resilience of our tax system. I think we've got structural problems with the resilience of our politicians uh, and structural problems with the resilience of companies that are asked to pay tax. And until we, over <laughs> until we overcome that problem, then we're going to be stuck with a much lower tax to GDP ratio than we previously had. Uh, and if coming back to, you know, why the GST revenue is not growing, Massive spending on private schools, massive spending on private health, both exempt from the GST. You want GST reform, put the GST on private school fees. Put the GST on private health insurance. Good luck with the politics of that. <laughs> Kerry, don't feel like you have to engage with Richard on, on the, <laughs> the, the super and the housing. Oh. I asked you to talk about international challenges. Yes, You're welcome right. to focus on that. No, I'm, I'm happy to discuss it more broadly. I think the tax agenda is actually something good that has come out of the GFC. I, I don't believe we would have the same amount of people here today if it wasn't for the GFC. It clearly put tax reform on the agenda, especially in the international tax setting, but I think it does raise issues like superannuation. And I tend to favour Richard's argument, argument a little more. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Um, <laughs> so do the 95%. I'm just dealing with facts. <laughs> um, I'll leave that one alone. Um, but I think Richard raised a really good point in relation to the MRRT, which is a really solid good tax. It happened to be captured by big mining companies. And that's, in my opinion, why it failed. 
Um, but the public is engaging in these conversations and the commissioner said that we need to foster willing participation. And he was talking in the context of the 95 percenters who pay, but I think that's broader. I think it's willing participation in discussing tax issues and working out what we consider is a fair tax system. What are our core tax values? What makes up a robust system? And the, the G20 did a lot in terms of overcoming the consequences of the, the GFC, and they're carrying on with that. We've already seen a tangible outcome in terms of the common reporting standard being adopted, and it is one of the three uh, agenda items for the G20 in relation to tax. Uh, fingers crossed we see some more tangible outcomes uh, coming out tonight and over the weekend at the finance minister's meeting in Cairns because I think something like um, the common reporting standard is a fantastic start, but it's just a start, but I'm not convinced that would have happened without the GFC. Commissioner, I'm going to give you nearly, I've got the last word actually, but I'm, I'm going to give you the second last word uh, in our session. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, no, it feels like it's true. <laughs> I did warn them all that this was live streamed, that we would have media present, that it is going to stay live on the web, you know, for posterity or at least for a period of time so that uh, they, they would need to commit. And we might have strayed into slightly too controversial territory. Um, so, look, I think we're actually just uh, more or less wrapping uh, to, to a close here. Uh, I think that uh, this audience here shows that we do have a substantial amount of interest in this white paper process in spite of the fact that one could come to it with a great amount of cynicism. We do see in Australia, I, I, I agree with Richard, that there are vested interests might be the wrong word or it sounds... I mean, I've got vested interests, right? We all do. Those of us who are working full-time in good jobs have very substantial vested interests in the current superannuation system. Uh, if we've got enough money to have investment properties, which, you know, a large proportion of the working population of Australia in the middle level actually do, uh, they have a very substantial vested interest in negative gearing. Uh, and we can see that all the way across our system. And so we, we do have a difficult reform process because we have large sections of the population who are heavily engaged with particular uh, winning and losing type outcomes from, from reform. In the corporate sector, we have Australian companies who are providing mutation credits, paying substantial amounts of Australian tax sometimes, uh, engaging in competition with multinationals uh, who have different interests, but you know, bring substantial technology and benefits to our shores. Don't forget that. Uh, so we've got a lot of uh, packaging to do. Uh, I can't entice him to no, He's not going to give a last word. So I'd like uh, if you would join me in thanking my panel, Paul, Richard, Kerry and Chris.